here. So Chris Mooney, a liberal, wrote quite an interesting book called The Republican Brain. And he draws on all sorts of scientific studies which indicate that uh, Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives don't just think differently, but they experience the world differently, not just cognitively, but over your overall physiologically. That uh, people who are right wing conservatives, they have a much stronger startle reflex. They have a much stronger psychological physiological need for closure, for law and order, right? For distinctions, all right? Such as distinctions between men and women, adults and children, between the in-group and the out-group, between your nation and other nations, between law and order and anarchy and disorder, right? To be on the right is to have much stronger need for law and order, for closure, for these fundamental distinctions, such as between men and women, while to be on the left Right, they believe in a much greater distance between your instinctual reactions and how you finally speak and behave. So when people tap into more primal experiences, such as they consume alcohol or they get married, they have children, they want to be able to hold on to their spouse, they want to live in a society that uh, perhaps tr- treats sex as something transcendent, and so they want to decrease incentives to have abortions, to have extramarital affairs, to have promiscuous sex. Right? They, they want to live in a different sort of society. They want to live perhaps in a transcendent, magical society where people experience the presence of God, where their, their fellow citizens are much more likely to feel like they're walking with Jesus, to have you know, the presence of the divine in their life. All right? if, if people start tapping into these traditional allegiances, feelings, emotions, cognitive and physiological states, all right, people are much more likely to become right wing. So it doesn't surprise me that in today's world, all right, today's world, our leading institutions, our elites dominantly come from the left because the way the world is currently constituted, putting a great deal of space between your instinctive reactions and what you finally say and do, that seems to generally be a winning strategy in the professions such as law, medicine, accounting, dentistry, in academia, in, in being on TV, in being in the public eye, right? the greater the space you could generally put between your instinctive primal emotions and how you actually speak and behave, right? it seems to be much more adaptive to fitting into our leading institutions, to any company with an HR department. All right? You're going to do much better if you're able to suppress your primal emotions. Now, there's a big difference between cottaging and courting, all right? So if you're on the right, you're going to say, look, there's just a world of difference between cottaging and courting, and the further left you go, the more likely you are to understand cottaging as not that different from courting, just a a different expression of courting. So let's get uh, Chris Mooney here speaking on the Republican brain. Right. Works. And I first became aware of this strange smart idea effect in 2008 based on this Pew data, just basic polling data on Republicans, independents, and Democrats' belief in global warming, except they broke it down by college grads and not college grads. Uh, So what this means is if you've got Republican, independent, Democrat, college grads, Republican, independent, Democrat, not college grads, uh, what you're seeing then is that if you're a Republican, the higher your level of education, the more likely you are to reject scientific reality, okay? Because global warming is real and caused by humans. Um, but if you're an independent or a Democrat, the higher your level of education, the more likely you are to accept scientific reality. So this is the smart idea effect. More education for Republicans equals more denial of reality. Now, this guy and liberals and leftists in general, they love evolution, except when it comes to evolution over the past 10,000 years as it affects the brain and physiology and different personality uh, basics between different groups, all right? Obviously, different groups of people evolved in very different circumstances, producing people with very different levels of uh, personality traits as well as cognitive traits and athletic traits and predispositions towards physical aggression. 
Uh, that part of reality, that part of science, right, liberals and lefties don't want any part of, generally speaking. So the most replicated, so the most scientific part of the social sciences is that there are significant group differences, particularly with regard to IQ, and that uh, IQ has tremendous predictive power for groups, not necessarily for individuals, but for groups. All right, that part of science, all right, they don't want any part of. So again, like, what is up with this? And it doesn't just happen on scientific issues. Uh, this effect has been detected, the same smart age effect, um, with a non-scientific but clearly false claim, the claim that President Obama is a Muslim. And John Sides, a political scientist at George Washington, uh, studied how belief in this false... Okay, so this idea of the Bertha controversy that uh, Barack Obama is a Muslim, yeah, factually inaccurate. Does it get at something that Barack Obama feels quite separate and distinct from any other president we have, that he feels quite separate from many, perhaps most Americans, that uh, this is you know, somewhat of an alien figure who's coming to govern us. Yeah, I think they may be getting onto a more profound truth than just the facts on the ground where they're clearly wrong, right? Barack Obama was born in Hawaii, and Barack Obama is not a Muslim. He's not a religious guy. False claim had increased from March 2009 to August 2010, and again, he broke it down by education. All right, so you got Republicans on the left, the red lines, Democrats on the right, the blue lines. Okay, clearly the belief increases more. Uh, among the Republicans, but then you got college grad, high school or less, and some college, and the slopes are much greater for the some college and college grads than for the high school or less. So again, it's knowing more as a Republican that makes you more likely to believe these wrong things. So like, what is going on with Republicans? What is up <laughs> with this? And is this sort of political environmental account where, oh, there's- Okay, so Republicans are much less compliant with elite directives because elites tend to dominantly come from the left. Republicans are much more suspicious of the establishment and of our leading institutions because the establishment and our leading institutions are dominated by the left. This makes sense. Now, I am not inherently anti-establishment or pro-populist, nor am I inherently anti-populist or uh, anti-establishment or anti-elite. I think I have a nuanced perspective. Sometimes the populists are right and sometimes the elites are right. Sometimes the people are right, sometimes the elites are right, sometimes the institutions are right, and sometimes the, the great mass of people are right. So I don't, you know, I don't side with any you know, particular uh, partisan perspective on, on life here. I, I believe that sometimes that a, a left-wing approach to life would be more adaptive, we'd be better suited to dealing with a particular situation, and other times a more right-wing, exclusive you know, high in-group loyalty doing things traditionally will be more adaptive. So we have, we have quite a few studies that show when people get drunk, all right, they become much more right-wing, all right? High blood alcohol contents, all right, correlates with more right-wing perspectives. When people get married and have kids, all right, they become incredibly busy and their life kind of shrinks down to their family and looking after their kids, they tend to become much more right-wing. They tend to be much tougher on crime. They tend to have more strongly pro-military, pro-police perspectives, right? Having a pronounced startle reflex, right? Particularly if you have kids, right? If you're startled by some threat to your kids, you're going to, generally speaking, have quite right-wing perspectives. You're going to have more concern and fear about outgroups. And so... Talking about all this through in neurological terms, uh, we've got evidence that conservatives may very well have larger amygdalas, all right, that affect how they process information in general. All right, amygdalas come from perhaps the earliest parts of our evolutionary process. These are just instinctive responses. Conservatives tend to have a much greater need for closure than liberals. Liberals tend to be much higher in openness. Conservatives tend to be much higher in conscientiousness. So liberals tend to have much more gray matter in the anterior cingulated cortex, the ACC. That's a newer part of our evolutionary system that suspends many of our automatic responses to assess facts and to detect errors. So it wouldn't surprise me that uh, liberals, people on the left, are better suited for some professions and that people on the right are better suited for other professions. So... Conservatives have this higher need for closure, higher need for law and order, higher need for conscientiousness, higher need for loyalty to the group than do people on the left. So conservatives and people on the right tend to have more immediate reactions and they are less likely to restrain their impulses. So they are less able to suspend judgment 
and people on the left are more tolerant of ambiguity and more willing to suspend and hold judgment on their immediate impulses. So which is best? Well, it, it depends on the situation and depends on the profession and de depends on, on time and place. I don't think either reaction is inherently superior. Now, people on the left, people who are liberals, all right, they don't place a premium on obedience and group solidarity. All right? They are children of the Enlightenment and they have an ethos that they don't bow to authority or pledge allegiance to a team. This is, anyway, this is how they perceive themselves, right? They like to be allied with scientists, right? Because being allied with science, right, you get to, you know, enjoy all sorts of uh, perks, such as you are regarded as open-minded and curious and tolerant and, and flexible, Right, you get to side with the elite when you ally yourself with science. Being a child of the Enlightenment means that you're, you know, much more predisposed to welcoming facts, except when those facts are, you know, basic, basic bitch evidence about group differences. All right, there somehow this uh, Enlightenment conviction that we should ally ourselves with facts there it seems to break down. So the old Enlightenment framework is that we can reason our way to an autonomous, you know, superior, more enlightened life. The new Enlightenment perspective says that uh, reason's not quite so strong and that reason's just part of our overall physiological makeup. So reason, our brain, takes place within the body and it's going to be profoundly affected by whatever's going on in the body. So if you're tight... In your body, if you're ill at ease in your body, you're going to likely be tight and ill at ease in your emotions and in your thinking. So recognizing how our brains are part of our bodies, all right, and that they're part of our overall survival reflexes, all right, this is more of a conservative and a traditional perspective, all right, that we have these instincts and that we develop these basic instincts because they've served us for thousands of years, all right? And we don't you know, aim to just completely corral our instincts on the basis of the power of our reason. So in the broader sense, enlightenment means respect for facts here. I'm reading from Ronnie Goodman's terrific book on conservative claims of cultural oppression. But our reason, right, it's shaped by our bodies. It's shaped by what's going on in our physiology. And our conscious thinking is not nearly as powerful as our genetic instincts and our early imprinting and all sorts of things that we are ignorant of that are shaping us, right? We have all sorts of vast invisible realms of neural circuitry that, are not, that is not accessible to our consciousness, right? This is the, the conservative critique of the Enlightenment, right? So the, the need for a narrative, the need for, for closure, the need for law and order cannot simply be erased and replaced by cold, hard reason. So I'll play a little bit more here from Chris Mooney talking about the Republican brain. You know, the conservative movement came to exist. It pulled the coalition together. You know, it needed the people who hated taxes. It needed the corporate people. It needed the religious right. Is that really getting at this kind of effect? Or do we need something more? And I now think that we do. What my first book didn't consider, and what political and journalistic classes today are terrified of facing, although they cannot avoid it anymore, because I said the science is not controversial, at least among the scientists. Uh, is the growing body of evidence suggesting that people who are liberal and people who are conservative are just different people, all right? And this is Chris Mooney speaking 10 years ago, and science as it's developed and studies as they've developed in this area since then has not changed, all right? His theories still hold up overall. The, the studies that he cites, all right, they have not been invalidated. So the modern liberal secular leftist perspective is that modernity... Is, is something we've arrived at by subtracting primitivism, by subtracting religion, by subtracting outdated folkways and traditions and you know, bigoted, racist, intolerant, xenophobic, homophobic, Islamophobic perspectives on life. And so by subtracting all these dumb, bad things, we now get to become enlightened. Uh, Ronnie Goodman's perspective is not this subtraction theory, is the mutation theory that the impulses of Protestantism to you know, be wholehearted with God, to have our faith in God shape all of our behavior and all of our thinking and all of our words, 
uh, this has now mutated into a totalitarian left-wing approach to life. So Chris Mooney's theories on the amygdala theory of conservatism, right, this comports with the, the Ronnie Goodman mutation counter-narrative, right? So the Ronnie Goodman mutation counter-narrative is kind of a philosophical expression of Chris Mooney's neurological perspective. And so the amygdala theory of conservatism kind of reveals the biological substratum of conservative and liberal thinking, and also it reveals the changes in the overall human makeup and physiology that uh, has occurred over the past couple of centuries. So the amygdala theory of conservatism is a concrete physiological correlative for the progressive buffering, the progressive reasoning, the progressive distancing, the progressive autonomous strategic sense that uh, we should develop as, as kind of courtier morality as opposed to the lord of the manor morality. All right, courtier morality means that we have to learn how to behave at court. We have to take into consideration the effect of our words and deeds on you know, every person who might possibly come into contact with what we're saying and doing versus lord of the manor morality where, hey, this is my home, this is my manor, I'm going to say and do what, what I want. And so conservatives tend to much more, you know, my home is my castle uh, approach to life. People on the left tend much more to a courtier approach to life where you, you flatter the people in power and you continually adjust yourself to how all the different elements of your community can then affect you and how they might receive whatever you're saying and doing. So the amygdala theory of conservatism provided by Chris Mooney, all right, it's a physiological correlate for Ronnie Goldman's philosophical understanding of a mutation narrative. So the mutation narrative places the amygdala theory of conservatism within history, just as the amygdala theory of conservatism places the mutation counter narrative within our brains, right? It provides a neurological perspective on the philosophical mutation theory. Right, back to Chris Mooney. Different in ways that go far beyond and that are probably prior to their beliefs in politics. Right? The beliefs in politics seem to be subsequent to the basic core differences, and the different beliefs in politics are what happen when people you know, who, who differ already are kind of pushed to figure out what they feel about the world, and then something just feel right naturally, and some things just don't feel right naturally. Right? As I went to work on a new book to succeed the Republican War on Science about... Right, so much of conservatism revolves around a greater trust in uh, basic allegiances to blood and soil, to family, to tribe, to, to nation. And from a left-wing, you know, liberal perspective, we should try to transcend these primitive ties and become more enlightened. So from a conservative perspective, we notice that when people say something politically incorrect, such as what has been revealed about Richard Ananya, who was writing under the, the word, you know, the pseudonym Richard Host, all right, he got incorrect for got into trouble for saying things that are politically incorrect. And when this happens, you know, people on the left are prepared to bring the full force of their rhetorical firepower you know, to bear in their attacks against conservatives. And they can always line up 15 different academic experts to you know, eviscerate conservatives. And so liberals will try to argue through the power of reason you know, why conservatives are wrong. Conservatives will use the power of reason, but their ties are to a different place, ultimately, than reason. Their ties are to tradition, to family, to tribe, to nation, right? To familiar ways of organizing people, to God, to religion, to allegiances, to blood and soil. So the liberal left, their, their allegiance is to reason and enlightenment and education and science. People on the right, their allegiances will tend much more towards blood, soil, family, tribe, nation, traditional ways of doing things. So we're talking here about a battle over neurological stakes. And people on the left will try to, you know, argue their way to success. Uh, people on the right will tend to put their allegiances to family, tribe, nation, to traditional ways of doing things first before the power of reason. So people on the left look at beliefs and worldviews 
and political, religious, cultural orientations as disembodied, you know, separate from our bodies, kind of suspended above us in the ether, and that we should strive to that kind of disembodied, suspended application of reason, turning us into strategic, autonomous, buffered agents, right? So the left-wing perspective is, oh, all you have to do is, you know, change this bit of information, replace incorrect information with correct information, and wrong beliefs will be dispelled like bursting a soap bubble. But the truth is our beliefs are physical, right? Our beliefs come from within our body. They're part of our anatomy, right? Attacking our beliefs is like a, a t punching someone in the face. It's like pricking his skin or worse. So liberals will shrug off claims that they are engaged in an assault against conservatives and their values because they remain under the spell of the old enlightenment. They believe that our beliefs are something that is suspended above us in the ether, therefore immune from assault. So liberals... Her outrage when conservatives complain of their persecution by liberals when what conservatives really mean is not imprisonment, not excommunication, not disenfranchisement, but criticism, such as editorials expressing disagreement with them. But when understood in a natural way, this criticism is an intrusive thing. It is like punching someone in the face. Right? Our beliefs are as precious to us often as our face, as our skin. Right? And so cutting away traditional forms of identity, such as that uh, marriage is between a man and a woman, that uh, sex, gender, is something that is biologically determined, that uh, the military should be a heterosexual institution. All right, by cutting away these traditional forms of identity, you are cutting away the synaptic strength of the neural connections that underpin strict father morality or conservative morality or the traditional perspective on life. This is experienced as an assault. And so this is why properly understanding the new enlightenment that our reasoning faculties occur within our bodies, this endows the conservative claims of cultural oppression with a new credibility. So Jonah Goldberg, when he talks to young people about uh, whether conservatives can replay culture, he says, yeah, be happy. Nothing ticks off the left more than a happy conservative. Because a happy person is generally someone who's behaving and, and acting within the traditions of their people, within the allegiances of tradition to, to family, to tribe, to nation, to, to religion. So the more the liberal left wins, the more that means the unraveling of the social structures that sustain meaning and that sustain the synaptic firings of people on the right. And to deactivate these synaptic firings to deactivate the social structures that undermine meaning is to deactivate the persons constituted by these mental makeups, right? So this is experienced as tantamount to imprisonment or disenfranchisement. This is why many Americans feel like they are in captivity because they are operating in a world where the left dominates our institutions, dominates our elites. And so many Americans, particularly on the right, feel like they are living in captivity, that they are living disenfranchised, even imprisoned life, that the very foundations of their self, of, the, of their meaning, of everything that brings you know, purpose and structure and coherence to their life is being rapidly hacked away by the liberal left. And this makes it very happy for people on the right to be, very difficult for people on the right to be happy when liberals are just systematically, you know, cutting away the very basis for their meaning and purpose in life. Why denial of reality is even worse now, okay? You know, we didn't have claims that Obama is a Muslim back in 2005. We didn't have claims that he's a Kenyan uh, back in 2005. You know, these, this kind of stuff, and on and on and on. I just couldn't ignore this body of research any longer. This research suggesting that our political beliefs and our factual beliefs are partly the result of a core set of personality traits or psychological traits, or even in some cases physiological traits, upon which people differ, and the differences are at least partly inherited, okay? Now, I want to be clear at the outset, that liberals and conservatives are different people on average is just a fact. It is a fact that is value neutral. What you make of it is in your own hands. My contention is just that you cannot ignore it because it's a fact about the world. I think it helps us see a lot of things that is wrong with liberals, aka us, um, as well as things that are wrong with conservatives, and also see strengths in conservatives. Um, and I'll explain all that. But right now, let's just deal with the fact itself. It turns out that like all- Okay, so what happens when people lose a sense that, li that life is worth living? What happens when the structures that give their life meaning and purpose and coherence are hacked away and destroyed? Right? When people 
stop feeling that their life is worth living. They stop reproducing. They stop making an effort. They, they stop working. They simply lie down and die beside streams full of fish. All right, this is anthropologists report that. Food is not the primary nourishment of man. It's the New Testament notes. Man will not live by bread alone. So short of natural catastrophe, the only time that life grinds to a halt or absolutely explodes into anarchy and chaos is when a culture falls down on its job of constructing a meaningful hero system for its members. And because the left dominates our institutions and our elite, right, our culture is steadily losing a meaningful hero system for people who are not on the left. Right? So why have so many Americans lost interest in having children? Perhaps right, everything that used to give people's lives meaning is being steadily eroded. So liberals say that uh, their arguments are merely symbolic, right? that uh, you know, conservatives are overly sensitive, but the institutions and the practices such as marriages between a man and a woman, that uh, people are of the sex that they were born biologically, that the military is a heterosexual institution, that uh, uh, homosexual sex does not enjoy the same sanctity or uh, approval as monogamous heterosexual marital sex, right? When you reduce these social structures, right, you are hacking away at the structures that give meaning to people who are not on the left. And if we have strong emotional convictions about something, such as that marriage is heterosexual, that our military should be heterosexual, that uh, people are born biologically, you know, male or female, then these convictions are effectively an actual physical part of us. They, these convictions don't reside in a particular brain cell or neuron. They reside in the complex connections between our brain cells, between our neurons, between you know, various patterns of neural activation that occur within our body. So the more we activate a particular series of connections, the more powerful these connections become. And these connections grow to become more and more a part of us, like the ability to play a guitar or juggle a soccer ball. So the more you go to church, the more you go to synagogue, the more you participate in a traditional form of life, and the more upsetting it will be for you when the secular liberal left takes more and more control of our society. So liberals dismiss most conservative complaints as just vague premonitions of erosion or unraveling of some ethereal social fiber. That uh, conservatives, you know, they just have these you know, kind of weird... Uh, irrational concerns. But the gradual unraveling of a neurologically encoded hero narrative, right, the erosion of its synaptic strength at the hands of a hostile cultural environment that fails to activate and works to deactivate the very synaptic connections that underpin conservative identities and hero systems is, you know, cutting away everything that makes life full of meaning and purpose and coherence for millions of Americans, right? These neural connections are as much a part of us as are our limbs, our organs, and our bank accounts, right? So these harms may not be clearly visible and incontestable, like the harms of famine and disease and stagnating wages, but that does not make them any less real if we develop a more sophisticated understanding of reality, so one way of understanding the difference between the left and the right is that the right is more about strict father morality, which is concerned with moral order. And the left is more about you know, nurturing mother morality. So right-wing grievances, just like left-wing grievances, not just merely symbolic, right? Symbols such as heterosexual marriage or a heterosexual military or you know, that... Uh, we are the biological sex we were born as, right? these are as substantial as anything else. So lefties will say, oh, strict father morality, that, that just puts a priority on metaphorical morality over experienced morality. But strict father morality versus nurturing mother morality, right? these are both equally experiential. Right? Morality itself is encoded in our neurological system. The highest ideals of strict father morality may not track human flourishing in the same sense that uh, you know, those on the left 
who associate with nurturing mother morality believe. But the frustrations of strict father morality do have profound consequences for people's flourishing. Right? So many conservative polemics against the left get their facts wrong. Much of right-wing punditry is absurd, but they often get the subjective experience right. right? So from an old enlightenment rational distinction, if you don't get the facts right, then your argument doesn't matter. But the new enlightenment understanding that our thoughts occur within our bodies, right? that our thoughts and our synaptic firings that uh, form neural patterns, right? this is just as much a part of us as our limbs and our organs. And is just as tangible and just as real and just as valuable as many facts and many economic realities that uh, liberals privilege as uniquely substantive. So people on the left, like Chris Mo Mooney, you know, deplore the alternative reality of the right and its development of a counter expertise to thwart scientific, academic, elite, mainstream knowledge. That these are just expedients serving some general need for belief affirmation, ideological activation. But what's going on with the right is much more profoundly understood as specific responses to the growing prestige accorded to the left-wing strategic autonomous buffet identity to the particular social and cultural conditions under which this identity is neurally activated and considered the one that we should all strive for. So conservative counter expertise is not just about advancing deeply held beliefs, but something much deeper than beliefs. It's about the assertion of one's hero system as against another. It's the assertion of one cosmological orientation against another. It's not just a brute refusal you know, against facts. It's a protest against the liberal, non-explicit, you know, buffered, strategic, distant engagement with the world. It's against, you know, certain privileging of certain functioning of the body in the physical and social world. So people like Chris Mooney, they talk about the conservative quest for ideological activation as just some kind of irrational special defensiveness vis-a-vis -vis cherished convictions. But this activation is ultimately the defense of one hero system against another. It is the defense of one physiological, neurological, affective, meaning emotional, instinctual structure against the imposition of another. It is the activation, not just of a belief system, but of a hero system. It's the activation of an entire organism against a, an environment that's become hostile to it. It's the activation of an entire being against social meanings that have been changed that now work to undermine the being sense of self. So people on the left focus on epistemology, right? They want to trivialize this cosmological grievance, this hero system, this physiological total being protest against a liberal left you know, rationalizing, civilizing process. So the conservatives may indeed have a larger amygdala and they may need a higher you know, need for closure, right? But this very neural pattern, this very you know, organ in the body, this very amygdala, right, is being targeted by the disciplines and repressions of the distant, autonomous, buffered, left-wing identity that is taking over our culture, right? The success of the left feels for people who are not on the left like an alien imposition just like barack obama's rise felt to many americans particularly on the right like an alien imposition as a transgression against our very human nature's default setting so people on the left they fail ultimate sophistication because they overlook the implications of what's going on in our bodies the natural neurological impulses behind our political beliefs. So what we have here is a conflict not between primarily rival ideologies, not between rival systems of belief, but between different makeups of the human being for whom their belief systems and ideologies are simply expressions of this different physiology. But here's uh, Chris Mooney. All important insights, this is not a new one. And as I researched this, I came across this uh, Gilbert and Sullivan comic opera called Iolanthe, which is from the late 1800s, actually. Uh, and in it, they're kind of joking, but they express this idea that, hey, our political views are really inherited. And they do it in this comic verse, which I'm going to read to you. 
Nature always does contrive that every boy and every gal that's born into this world alive is either a little liberal or else a little conservative. Or at least that's how I have to make it rhyme. I don't know how they made it rhyme uh, back then. Uh, so then, what is this? We can tell liberals and conservatives apart as children, like in the sandbox? That's not how we normally think of politics. Um, but actually, there's research suggesting that that may well be so. So the observation is not new, but it's extremely controversial and not accepted, because we like to think about politics from a sort of blank slate perspective to invoke Steven Pinker. We like to ignore all kinds of things about human nature, and this is one of them. And so we like to assume that, oh, you know, we came to our views by thinking about the issues. But we just, you know, we started out from different places, so we ended up in different places. You know, put me in a different situation with different influences on me, and I could have been a right winger. Right? Okay, so people on the left, like Chris Mooney, they want to associate themselves with science, and they do that because they believe they're primarily just motivated by truth. But a large part of their motivation resides in they want to surround themselves with the prestige, the admiration surrounding the scientific stance, and with it, a sense of freedom, power, control, invulnerability, dignity, which it radiates. So it is this need to bask in science's you know, winning ethos. Right? Uh, is, there, is there any uh, approach to life that is more venerated in our society today than, than science? Right? It's the need to bask in the scientific stance and ethos of disengaged self-control, self-reflexivity, distance from traditional emotions and ties to, to family, nation, blood and soil. But this compels people on the left to see conservative claims as confused and contrived. But uh, their own particular brand of enlightenment and empiricism is not culturally neutral. Their own pursuit of truth is not neutral, right? It's rather, it's crafted in reflection of their own particular subjective hero system. They want to uphold a set of social meaning, a hero system that will ratify the ethos that they try to embody of disengaged self-control and self-reflexivity. They, they see this as essential human nature, the, the true self that lies dormant and suppressed among the unwashed masses. Right? They, they believe that the world should be freshly flooded with the light of enlightenment. And so this buffered, liberal, disengaged, rational identity is the silent, unquestioned backdrop against which they experience life, against which they define what is harmful. And they see everything outside of this engaged, buffered identity as rightly an object of scorn and incredulity. Right, so people on the right are much more at ease with the irrational in human nature, right? Nationalism is not particularly rational. A uh, love of family, love of people like you is not necessarily particularly rational. It's just something that has power over us. But it's something that the liberal left thinks that we should try to overcome and supersede. So people on the left see the issues between us as primarily matters of truth. They fail to see what lies underneath it, which is not dogma, but it is dopamine. It's the activation of a neural circuitry that sustains us in our various hero systems. So this is what the culturally inflected naturalism of people on the left cannot see. So people on the left think they have this evolved need for truth, need for cognition, need for accuracy, and need to distinguish themselves from the herd. Right? And this is the culture that produces the cognitive elitism that now rules us. Right? This is a culture where those who lead have been trained and groomed to bear the appropriate cultural markers of being anointed as an intellectual and then accorded a deference that is withheld from those who lack these cultural markers. So we have an evolved capacity for disgust. Right? It can be directed, for example, against outgroups or against homosexuality. All right? The intellectualism of the liberal elites has e evolved their capacity for disgust and turned it not against homosexuals, not against uh, racial outgroups, but against those who hold on to traditional allegiances, such as to blood, soil, family, nation, uh, to heterosexual understandings of, of marriage and military, and to biological understandings of sexual identity. So we all have a disgust reflex. People on the left have it as well. They have developed their disgust reflex against traditionalists, while people on the right have developed their disgust reflex for people outside of the type of ordered traditional society that makes them feel safe. So people on the left with an evolved need for cognition, need for accuracy, 
right, that's been embedded in their angular cingulated cortex, right, this is being culturally harnessed to all sorts of imperative imperatives that produce the desired neurological stimuli, but at the cost of truth, of intellectual substance, honesty, and you know, traditional ways of living. So liberals find it hard physiologically to disagree with what scientists have to say. Right? This is not the product of individual reflection. It's not the product of a desire for truth. It's a reflexive, socially inculcated response to the rhetoric and the airs of the scientists, of the intellectual, to the language, the style, the demeanor of the new cognitive elite, which is a mutated, secularized version of the original spiritual vision of Protestantism. So for our ruling cognitive elite now, identity trumps truth. Right? If you have the cultural markers that you have this distant, autonomous, buffered identity, then you are considered you know, a worthy person. So people on the left think they're primarily motivated by seeking truth, but much of their motivation resides in they want to be surrounded by the prestige and the admiration that comes with the scientific stance itself, right? with the freedom, power, control, invulnerability, and dignity that it radi radiates. So for people on the left, the notions that the common people hold true, such as clinging to guns and religion, these are all just like grunts. They're, they're mere signs of pain, pleasure, and frustration. Right? So the liberal left has taken on this peculiar courtly rationality. And people who don't have it are assigned a merely animal status. People who are just grunting, bereft of cognitive content, they're just expressions of the merely animal. So people on the left, they operated out of this sublimated, disciplined, intellectualized, distant, ethereal hero system, uh, quite distinct from the traditional allegiances that gave life coherence and meaning. So very few people on the left and very few philosophers and very few academics and very few elite realize how much of their influence is conveyed through expression, through turn of voice rather than argument. So nuances of disappointment and contempt will often do far more to direct people than a ton of good arguments. Let's get a little bit more here for Chris Mooney talking about the Republican brain. Right. Right. Yeah, in a way. Um, so the new science really challenges that assumption. Because if, if your political ideology is really just your set of conscious thoughts about how the world you know, and how politics should be structured, if that's really what it is, uh, then why on earth, and if it's purely the result of thinking rationally about the issues, then why would you find differences between liberals and conservatives in all kinds of areas that have nothing to do with politics? Right? Why would you find differences between them in how they organize their bedrooms? All right? But you do. Liberals are messier. Right? And I think you guys probably know this. You, this is probably kind of obvious to you, right? Liberals keep messier living spaces than conservatives do. Everything I'm saying here is based on published peer-reviewed research. And if, if politics is just you know, about our rational differences about how we think society should be ordered and structured, then why would liberals and conservatives have different preferences for art? But they do. Liberals are more appreciative of abstract art. Conservatives more like representational art, portraits and landscape paintings. Right? Is that political ideology? Well, and if it isn't, why is it a reliable way of distinguishing between what we think of as left and right? Or why do the two groups have different senses of humor? Okay? But they clearly have very different senses of humor. All right? And there is actually a real psychology study showing, studying liberal conservative responses to Colbert. And what it finds is that good news is that both groups think he's funny. Bad news is they think he's funny for completely different reasons. And liberals think he's funny because he's using satire to make fun of conservatives. And conservatives think that deep down he is a conservative. <laughs> now, what is that? OK, so Steve Saylor writes about the Richard Hanania controversy. Richard Hanania has got a new book coming out, The Origins of Work, Civil Rights Law, Corporate America, and the Triumph of Identity Politics. And uh, Steve says, I never dox anyway, but a few months ago, for my own information, I looked into the rumor that Richard Hanania used to be Richard Host, whom I vaguely record as an intelligent, strident, on the nose, and not hugely interesting, minor, far right internet personality of a dozen years ago. I didn't find anything to disprove the rumor. Hanania and Host were both anti Christians who had read The Bell Curve. On the other hand, Richard Hanania, who is in his late 30s, is now so much better of a writer than Richard Hurst was 12 years ago that I wasn't sure I believed they were the same guy. I mean, how much do writers change? Steve Saylor says, I have always been who I am. 
as David Foster Wallace said, in the end, you turn out to be who you are. So Steve Saylor fired away the Hananya Hurst question away as uh, unanswered. If uh, Richard Hurst had improved enough to become Richard Hananya, that would be unusual and impressive. Now the Huffington Post has exposed Hananya as Hurst and Hananya has admitted it. But Hananya now says he's not an extremist anymore. He's now a Brian Kaplan style open borders libertarian. Because what could be less extremist than supporting open borders? Steve Saylor concludes, I went ahead and pre-ordered Richard Hananya's book from Amazon to do my bit to persuade the publisher not to cancel it. All right, back to Chris Mooney. What does that say about the nature of political ideology? Um, and, you know, and the differences, the differences between left and right, you know, they just go on and on and on and on. Uh, a scientist with whom I collaborated for part of the book, his name is Everett Young, he found in his PhD dissertation, Studying Liberals and Conservatives, that conservatives were more likely to think the fans of rival sports teams are just bad people. All right? They were more likely to want to keep germs out of their bodies. And they were more likely to elect a candidate to Congress, to Congress who keeps his or her lawn neatly edged. So is that ideology? It's a reliable way of determining who's on the left and who's the right. And, and the research just gets weirder, because there's also fascinating psychology studies, again, peer-reviewed, published in the literature, suggesting that you can take a liberal and make them into a temporary conservative right, through various kinds of psychological or physiological manipulation. Right? You don't do this by convincing them of the rightness of conservative ideas. But you know how you can do it? One way you can do it is through alcohol intoxication. <laughs> right? um, so the, the scientists actually did this. They set, up, they, set, they set up outside of a bar, and they had a political questionnaire, and they had a breathalyzer. This is good research, right? <laughs> and uh, so they gave people... Yeah, as people get drunker, as people get more in touch with traditional ties, they become you know, much more right-wing when they have children. Uh, let's uh, have a look here at what's going on with the Sean Hannity show. We'll keep an eye on Sean, see if there's any breaking news. Meanwhile, back in 2011, Steve Saylor says in a much-praised article, Chris Mooney, who I was just playing excerpts from, writes in the left-wing publication Mother Jones about the science of why we don't believe in science. And he explains why Republicans hate science. But to be fair, he then goes on to ask, so is there a case study of science denial that largely occupies the political left? Yes. The claim that childhood vaccines are causing an epidemic of autism. Its most famous proponents are an environmentalist, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and numerous Hollywood celebrities such as Jenny McCarthy and Jim Carrey. Huffington Post gives a very large megaphone to denialists, and Seth Mnookin, author of the new book, The Panic Virus, notes that if you want to find vaccine deniers, all you need to do is go hang out at Whole Foods. So, right, autism vaccines are examples of science denial on the left, but what else is there? You've got the hounding of great scientists such as James Watson, uh, formidable thinkers such as Larry Summers. They both were hounded out of their jobs for politically incorrect statements about the science of intelligence. Right, and this hounding, I mean, that's far more significant than uh, what Jen Jenny McCarthy and Jim Carrey and their views on vaccines. So there are a lot of, a lot of people on the left, much of leftism, who is very anti-science, and the science shows that uh, different groups have different strengths and different virtues. Now, most of the people who get all worked up about vaccines are parents of children with autism, right? They, they've latched onto an idea that wasn't terribly implausible at the time, an idea that gave them a little hope or some notion of cause and effect didn't turn out to be right. But how can you make the same excuses for the commissars of political correctness who go after those who simply try to tell the truth? Right, back to Chris Mooney here. Everywhere they turned, they saw one. Maybe they would always be conservative. But it's probably a temporary thing. Uh, so it's suggesting there's something about ideology that you know, you're activating these kind of visceral impulses, or in the alcohol case, you're, you're doing something cognitive, and it's leading to ideological outcomes. Uh, and this is, these are not the only things that reliably turn a liberal into a conservative. The most reliable of all, and we all know this, even if we may not admit it, the most reliable of all is causing them to feel mortal fear. All right? You want to push people to the right, you want to push a country to the right, just attack it. Just attack it and make people feel like they might die, and you will see people move to the right. All right? So again, this suggests that ideology is about something below the surface, not rational. It's not about the facts of the issues. So what the heck is it? Where does it live? Where is it housed? Well, as one scientist put it to me, it is not going to be in the elbow. All right? It is going to be in the brain. And yes, we have studies showing brain differences between liberals and conservatives, measurable brain differences. Big caveat, this is not what I based the book on. This is the new stuff. This is the controversial stuff. Uh, we don't know exactly what it means. And if this was the only research that we had, I wouldn't write a book about it because I think it's too new and too uncertain. But given that it is kind of the icing on the cake, 
and all the psychological stuff has been going on for decades, uh, and, it, and it is in line with that research. It doesn't refute it, it just confirms it in a new way. I think we should talk about it. So this is a study of University College of London students. All right, so we got British left, right, not American left, right, and there are differences, but there are also overlaps. And what they found uh, was that on average, and that's very important to say on average, the conservatives had a somewhat larger right amygdala. What is the amygdala? The amygdala is the brain's fear and threat center. We share it with other animals. We should be glad that we have it because it keeps us alive. All right? It is there to preserve us in situations of threat and situations of fear. When the amygdala is activated, you run. I mean, it does other things as well. Other, all parts of the brain do many things. Um, but, but this is one of its clear core functions. And in a situation where you're feeling that kind of fear, the amygdala takes over. It runs an automatic response program. It's called fight or flight. And it runs your body. Okay? It runs things. And it is evolved to do this. And it is evolved to keep you alive. All right? Everybody has one. It's just that on, in the conservatives, it was in this study slightly larger. All right? And now in the liberals, they found more gray matter in the anterior cingulate cortex. The anterior cingulate is a region that has been shown in a lot of studies to be, to be, seems to be playing a role in what's called error detection. In other words, you're going about some pattern of behavior, and suddenly you say, stop, wait, stop. I've got to do something different. I've got to change. I'm making a mistake. I shouldn't do this. All right? Liberals are somehow doing that more. All right? In this study, and these are not the only studies that... It okay, let's play a little bit. This is uh, Mickey Kaus talking with Ann Corta. Oh. The dentist can't just say, Jeff, you're fired because they have to be technically independent. I mean, oh. he, could send over, he could send over Casey and she could just glare at him until he quit. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, they, he doesn't have control of his own campaign, really, at least the money part. Uh, and that's and, where uh, that ad came from with the, the Brad Pitt yeah. ad, right? What's the Brad Pitt ad? You know, the one about um, Trump supporting transgenders. Oh, the, yeah, right. But was Brad Pitt in that one? Oh, I thought he was. <laughs> putting, up, putting up the antenna in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Probably. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, yes, that is where that ad came from. And he's not, and he phrases everything in, in strange ways. Like, for example, he, he was totally right on this African-American studies thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Tim Scott, uh, you know, totally buys the liberal line and implies that DeSantis just doesn't realize how evil slavery was. You yeah. know, the whole 166 of the 167 points were how evil slavery was. This one point was how resilient the slaves were and they actually managed to acquire skills under this horrible oppressive regime. Uh, and, uh, and it was endorsed by the black professor, it was pushed by the black professor uh, from Michigan who, uh, who was head of the panel. So um, instead of saying, um, you know, uh, you know, you fell for Kamala Harris's pitch. You know that you, you're 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 calling people racist when, in fact, we were we were just trying to teach this and keep critical race theory out of the schools. Instead of making a substantive thing, he said you were disloyal and you know sided with Kamala and me. Instead, and he left the substance out. Yes, I agree. That was very he weird. Should add, he should add this. He makes it all seem like it's personal. almost Trump Trump like. It's personal. Now, Brian Donalds is he was another black congressman who who jumped on the Kamala bandwagon a little bit. Uh, yep. He has a beef with because Donalds endorsed Trump instead of him. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so he's pissed at Donald. That, that's sort of understandable. The Tim Scott thing should have been more substantive. Uh, I, I, I still think it's interesting to rank them on how, how the three black people who sort of, uh, can I say the word Mau Mau? They didn't Mau Mau Trump, but they fell, uh, they fell in line with the Democrats in basically implying that DeSantis was a racist. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, Byron Donald's, his, he, he only, he tried to have it both ways. He said that the standards are, pre this course is pretty good. There's just this one thing I don't like. Well, the, that was that one thing was stupid, but the rest of it was okay. Uh, Byron, Scott didn't seem to have read it. I mean, he sort of was he was like confronted with it, and he said the same thing, which is, you know, slavery is bad, and we should realize it, you know. And, and so the, he, he was just sort of uninformed. It was, I don't think it was a calculated uh, stab in the back. I think Maybe it, it is calculated. And if we could pause for a second on on Tim Scott, I mean, it's just appalling the two judges he rejected, the Trump judges and the judges were actually really great under Trump because he had nothing to do with him. And one was, I think, a Stanford law grad who had written pieces in, or Stanford undergrad at least, written pieces in college criticizing the diversity regime, the diversity regime, and criticizing all of these um, college groups. I know we had them at law school. And, you know, there's the Hispanic Law Students Association and the Black Law Students Association and the Pacific Islanders Law Students Association and the Lesbian and Gay uh, Law Students Association. And he wrote, I mean, you, you have to really dig into the news coverage to see what it was he said, because thanks to Tim Scott, um, oh, and Marco Rubio, all the headlines were Tim Scott rejects judicial nominee who had racist writings in college. And it's just racist, 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 racist. So questioning the diversity regime is racist, Tim Scott. And the it, other one, he had worked for Jesse Helms. That was basically his crime. And he supported voter ID. And that was racist voting restrictions and postcards that were, you know, this is very suspicious. I assume they were sending out postcards um, saying that voter fraud is, is a crime. And the, the Helms campaign, although this guy who was nominated for a judgeship apparently had nothing to do with it, um, according to the New York Times. But the Helms campaign is sending out postcards. I mean, this is going back a long way to black areas. Black people have always and will always vote 90 percent for the Democrats um, saying I, I assume you can't vote if you're a felon or just sending out postcards saying voter fraud is a crime, but they'll never tell us what was in the postcards, which I always find that suspicious. If it was such a nasty, vicious, racist postcard, 
can you tell us what was in it? So I'm very suspicious of that. And again, um, it was definitely Tim Scott. And I think Marco Rubio voted against these judges. So, you know, Tim Scott, whose entire campaign is going around saying, America is not a racist country. At the drop of a hat, we'll accuse anybody, as long as it's a Republican, of racism. But they, 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 um, they, they, they won't, these, these conservative blacks will not give up the race bar. It's too easy, it's too cheap an advantage uh, to play. And they played it pretty quickly here. The yep. worst of them was James, uh, Congressman James yep. from Michigan, who yep. had, had no, there was no question of ignorance. He had plenty of time to review the facts. He, um, he, he made up a quote that somehow this course uh, said that blacks had a net benefit from slavery, which is completely insane and not in the course. Uh, uh, it just said that they managed to learn some skills that, you know, helped them in some way. Uh, uh, obviously, slavery as a whole was a horrible oppressive regime. And he said, you've now, I, I counsel Brother DeSantis, my brother in Christ, uh, <laughs> you've, you've now attacked two of the five Republicans in Congress. Uh, so he totally plays the race card. How can you attack your, your black Republicans? That's going to, you know, I, I mean, totally plays identity Disgusting. politics. So he's, he was the worst of them. And I also want to make a note here in case um, everyone doesn't read everything I put out on Substack. Um, the famous AP course in African-American studies that was loaded up with all the CRT stuff that you just mentioned. Um, and whoa, we had to listen to weeks and weeks of how um, Governor DeSantis was a fascist for refusing to adopt the AP African-American course. It had the same language, Mickey Kaus. It's right. the same language the National Park Service uses. It's the same language the Library of Congress uses. So cut the crap, Tim Scott and James Johns and, and, and Byron D Donaldson. Cut the crap. It's disgusting. Yeah, it was a completely phony issue. Uh, and I think it's so. unforgivable for a black Republican to attack another Republican, sucking up to the left and the mainstream media by falsely accusing someone of racism. There is there is nothing worse than being called a racist. And when you're called a racist by a, quote, fellow Republican, um, there, th that is unforgivable for any Republican to do that. I, and those, mm -hmm. that OK, let's get a little bit more here, Mickey and Anne. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not a Catholic, but I think the, the reasons I've, I've read them at some point, the reasons the Catholic Church gives for annulments, there's a list of like 10 things. And they're really serious things like um, affairs, um, like a gambling addiction, like like um, violence. But they're really serious things. I mean, unless you're a Kennedy and pay money to get your divorce. Um, but no, that is my view of marriage. I'm not picking on the gays. I'm not picking on um, the women who are in fake marriages with gays. <laughs> and again, I know a lot of them, but I'm against it. Um. Uh, uh, you did suffer a huge defeat, I think, on the cultural front this week when uh, <laughs> Joe Biden uh, recognized his seventh grandchild, which is the child Hunter had with a stripper in a night he doesn't even remember, I believe, or he says he didn't remember in his book.